Um, but really quickly, um, for my role, I meet individually with students who are interested in education, nonprofit, and government um, for individual career advising sessions. We also do events such as this and classroom presentations. Um, and Ellie does very similar work with me as well. And so if you have never been to the Career Center, please come see us. Um, we students about anything related to career, whether it's I have no idea what I want to do and I just want to explore a little bit, um, to I know exactly what I want to do, but I need to figure out how to do it. So um, our event today is going to be focused on um, higher education and working within higher ed. So we have some really amazing um, DePaul professionals joining us today um, from the staff side. And so we're really excited. We have a, a nice variety of roles. So we were really excited when they all said yes. Um, anyone who doesn't know higher ed super well yet, they're just good people. Um, and so we were really excited when everybody was able to join us today. Um, so really quickly, I'm going to have everyone just share um, their name, their pronouns, mine or she, her, um, and then their position title at DePaul and just like a super quick explanation of what that might look like. And whoever wants to start, feel free and we can kind of, um, you know, switch for each question, if that makes sense. Okay, I'll start. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanisha Arnold. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I serve as one of the assistant directors of um, campus activities in the Office of Student Involvement. Hi, um, my name is, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Giselle Saru. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I am an admission counselor in the Office of Undergraduate Admissions at DePaul. Um, and I am responsible for um, recruiting prospective freshman students. Hello, uh, I'm Gerald Cruz. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I'm an academic advisor at the College of Education uh, for all secondary education programs, grad and undergrad as well as all the clinical mental health counseling students. So anyone who wants to be a high school teacher or anyone who wants to be a therapist, I help them with academic advice. Great. Can you talk to us a little bit um, about your professional journey? So how you got to where you are today in this particular position, degrees you've attained, related experience you've built, um, just kind of that path that, you, that have le has led you here. I can start. Um, I am a DePaul graduate, so I graduated in 2020. Um, so I don't really have a an extensive career path per se, um, post grad life. Um, however, uh, once I graduated, um, like I did utilize like the career center resources. I used Handshake. I spoke to career counselors to kind of just like help me like build a resume and kind of figure out my footing career path wise. Um, so I ended up being a um, assistant teacher to a first grade classroom um, at a private school um, in the West Loop of Chicago um, for a year before I started this position at DePaul. Um, ultimately, I think what drew me towards it was my past experience in the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. Um, I was a tour guide at DePaul all four years and then um, I was the intern in the office as well. Um, but I think just knowing, having familiarity with the office, but also kind of enjoying um, assisting students through the admission process um, really enticed me to this position. So very happy to be here. Great. Uh, yeah, I guess I can go next. So I received my bachelor's in uh, secondary education and social sciences. So I'm actually an academic advisor from the program I graduated from here at DePaul. Um, when I was in college, I obviously wanted to be a high school teacher, and I was for a few years after finishing up my undergrad. Um, while I was in college, I actually worked as a student worker in financial accounts, um, which was super interesting because I learned a lot about that process. And it provided a good perspective for me in my role now, um, just because you can, you can kind of see how you want to adjust your interactions with your students depending upon the student needs. So in my role now, there's a lot of excitement and curiosity. I'm about finishing up their degree plan and they have questions for me about teaching and what that looks like. But while working in financial accounts, most of those meetings were with stressed students. So anytime money is involved, you know, it is a stressful conversation. So you kind of want to adjust um, the way you go about that conversation, depending on what the meeting is about. Um, during my undergraduate career, I also spent a lot of time in classrooms and as well as student teachings. Um, 
in these experiences, you really learn how important interacting with your students are and your student population. You just wanna build those deeper connections. Uh, most importantly, uh, one of the biggest things I learned is um, trying to figure out what someone's really trying to say to you. Um, after teaching in Chicago, Chicago Public Schools, I returned to DePaul as a student records and commencement coordinator for the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. Um, so that's where I learned how to maintain student records through degree audits, as well as understanding the process and to planning commencement, which is super, super fun. Um, and I also had the opportunity to learn a lot about students' degrees and posting those for degree conferral, which is a pretty big role in my job now. So kind of everything that I've done has led up to me being in this role now. And it's super, super exciting. And obviously I love DePaul very much. Yeah, and you sound like the perfect person to be supporting the student population that you're supporting, given that you went through that exact yeah. program and then, you know, had the teaching experience. I'm sure, you know, that experience is just so valuable. Yeah, the, the students really like it when they found out um, that I graduated from here. And it's, it's a pretty weird experience having all my professors become my colleagues and calling them by their first name, which is really <laughs> odd for me to transition to. But it's a pretty cool experience, I must say. I'm sure. Tanisha? Yeah. Um, so my professional journey, it has been um, quite the ride um, here in student affairs. Um, but that journey started at the University of Memphis. Um, I got my undergrad um, degree in English um, and my master's degree um, in leadership and policy studies uh, with a concentration in college student personnel. Um, and so after I finished my undergrad degree, I didn't quite know like what I was going to do next, um, kind of similar to colleagues that shared here, is being involved um, as a student leader. You know, I was tour guide and an orientation guide and involved in multiple student orgs. So, you know, very much borderline over involved <laughs> student um, leader. And so um, I had made up my mind that I was going to law school. And so, um, you know, it got time to start preparing for that LSAT and all that stuff. I'm like, I don't think I want to do this um, anymore. And so, um, you know, I talked with a couple of people who were um, in my master's program before I had got into it. And um, they were telling me about their journey. And I'm like, oh, you can have a career in this? Like, this is like for real? And they're like, yeah. Um, and so I think that was kind of what encouraged me to, um, you know, back to Memphis and get that master's to, um, degree and um, a lot of opportunities have opened up since since that time um, so you know after I finished my degree I uh, went on to um, work at Ohio State uh, where I was working in their um, division of student um, life and you know working with student activities and student orgs and campus programs um, and then came over here to DePaul which I've been here uh, a bit over three and a half years and um, still continuing to do that work um, with our um, campus events um, and uh, the Paul Activities Board as well as supporting um, student organization community um, as well. So definitely been a fun ride um, over the years um, in like student life. <laughs> yeah, it sounds it. And there's definitely this theme between all three of you um, in terms of being really involved students and I know for me, like, I didn't necessarily make the connection of like, oh, I enjoy college, I enjoy being involved, but I didn't make the connection right away of like, oh, I could do, I could do this, I could, <laughs> this could be my job. Um, and so it sounds like kind of similar experiences there, which is neat. Um, and so the next question kind of talks about choosing your professional path. And I feel like you guys really kind of already answered that um, really thoroughly. So thank you. I mean, can you talk a little bit about your current position? And I think this is where it can be a little bit confusing for students that are interested in higher ed, even when they maybe interact with an advisor or, or things like that. Um, can you talk in detail about what your day-to-day -day looks like? Because I think, um, you know, there can be misconceptions sometimes if, you know, somebody meets with an advisor, they assume, okay, that's their entire role, right? Um, and so I think it can be, um, a little bit misleading. Um, and so if you can just go a little bit more into detail of what that day-to-day -day might look like for you. Yeah, so um, I guess I can go first. So my day-to-day -day is filled. Um, I try to get it to work a little bit early just so I can answer all the emails that come in overnight. Um, as, as an academic advisor, if you're planning to be one, you get a lot of emails. I probably get one um, probably every 15 to 10 minutes. So 
So I get a lot, um, especially during registration, it's probably one every five minutes. So it is a lot of emails, a lot of answering emails and student meetings. Um, depending where we are in the quarter, um, it will impact how many meetings I have daily. Um, I'd say I, I have around maybe, um, maybe like 60 to 80 a month, um, which is a decent amount because my caseload of students is a little over 500, I'm around 550. Um, so besides doing student meetings and besides doing, um, you know, answering emails, we perform a lot of other things such as uh, degree audits. So what that means is basically I go through a student record and I make sure that they're on successful track for completion for student teaching, um, which is specific to my role. Um, obviously with other, other advisors, very different depending on your program, but we have to make sure that you guys are on track. Um, outside of that too, we do a lot of other things such as sit in on curriculum building meetings with our faculty chairs and our faculty presidents and things like that. Um, we sit in with um, them and while they're building the curriculum, we make sure that we understand why each class is offered when they are. If there are prerequisites to a class, why you can't take a class out of turn. Um, for example, we have a few um, teaching curriculum courses and it wouldn't make sense to skip over, you know, an entry level one before you get into the advanced courses. So we do a lot of that and a lot of it is checking into. So luckily for my role at the College of Ed, all of our education courses are in this building as well as my office. So I do have a lot of students that often just pop in to say hello um, and they talk to me for a few minutes after class. Um, a lot of it is academic advising, but um, now that I've had this role for a little bit, um, I've really built a relationship with a lot of my students where we've had a chance to talk about more things outside of school, such as career path, even just checking in. Um, college is a very stressful time and it's probably the biggest investment people have made up until this point in their life. So it's a really weird time with balancing school and your outside work. So even just you know lending a you know someone to listen to, um, being a good listener is probably the biggest role here because it is a lot, a lot to go through, and we all understand that working in higher ed. So I think that's most of my day to day. Um, a lot of putting out fires because a lot of things that go on, um, but it's just a lot of multitasking, and let's say that's what my day looks like. Um, I I will first start this with like. No two days, you know, no um, two days are the same, um, especially here in student involvement. I feel like something different is happening um, every day. And then that's really just with the nature of the, the type of work that we are, are doing here. Um, I'll start with like my responsibilities and then kind of work back to day to day. Um, so in my role as assistant director in the office, um, I oversee uh, campus activities. Um, and so underneath my area, um, I have the DePaul Activities Board. Board, uh, which is the programming board um, here at DePaul. And, and they do typically anywhere between 150 and two, to 200 events um, throughout the academic year. Um, and then also I uh, support our staff that um, oversees the major um, campus events um, here um, at DePaul. So that includes um, events and traditions such as Welcome Week and Midnight Breakfast and Ugly Sweater Party and the Gnome Hunt and so forth. Um, and so that is, those are the key areas um, of my work. I also um, supervise our student marketing team, um, which we have some very talented students um, here with us who are putting together our um, marketing um, that we put out from our office, as well as doing some sponsorships. Um, now, when we get to like the day to day, um, in my role, um, you know, I do a lot of supervising um, of staff um, who are working closely um, and directly with the campus events that are going on. And so um, oftentimes I'm, you know, having a lot of conversations about the details of like, how will these events look and how are we creating um, a fun and inviting um, experience for students when they step into um, these events and also kind of getting into the details of like what does the decor and the menu and um, you know other details look like um, making a lot of purchases um, is in my world as well um, you know we need a lot of stuff to make these events um, the success that they are and so um, making those purchases and working with external vendors um, to bring some of the activities that you see um, at these events. Um, so yeah, again, uh, each day looks differently, um, but that's kind of the gist of, of what day-to-day -day looks like. It's just having those conversations, building and, and putting together um, some solid campus experiences for our students to enjoy. 
Um, yeah, so in my role as an admissions counselor, um, essentially I am the point person between getting into DePaul and, you know, graduating high school, all of that stuff. So I guess in the day to day, um, I like monitor my own inbox. Um, I have a separate inbox exclusively for um, connecting with students and parents. Um, so mostly I'm answering emails, text messages, um, things like that. Um, I also uh, will do prospective student presentations, admitted student presentations. Um, I'm also like the support for our on-campus events, um, our kind of like prospective admittance events, um, just trying to get more students interested in coming to DePaul. Um, I'm also a, so all of the admission counselors have uh, territories as well. So I am the territory manager specifically for the Chicago West suburbs, um, Pennsylvania and Delaware, though I have yet to interact with any Delaware students. Um, so if you have, let me know, that would be wonderful. Um, so yeah, I'm, so I also will do um, like recruitment travel as well. So I actually just did my first round of recruitment travel in Pennsylvania. I was in, I drove the state of Pennsylvania. So that is a part of my job description now as well. Um, but yeah, mostly day to day is just kind of like interacting with people. I think both Tanisha and Gerald said it like really just communicating and listening is probably the most salient part of my day. So I would say there is a lot of, um, I don't know, a lot of like physical energy that goes into kind of trying to keep up a, a good energy um, to entice students to come to DePaul. Um, but it's very rewarding. Um, and just knowing that I can provide any sort of like easing of anxieties with the college admission process um, is really uh, validating and feels really good. So yeah, that's kind of my my duties. Giselle, I'm from Pennsylvania, so I'm gonna have to hear about where you went on your road trip at some point. Totally. <laughs> the big state, so props to you for driving through the whole thing. <laughs> um, so you guys actually have a question, um, which is, thinking about kind of what are really useful skills within higher ed. And you've touched on kind of some of these communication skills, um, listening. Are there any others that you would add um, that are really important in your day-to-day -day work? I think it's important to um, like be adaptable um, in the work that, that we're doing, um, a lot can happen, um, you know, day to day, especially on event days. Um, and sometimes the things that are happening are out of your control. And so it's like, how do you um, recover um, when the unexpected happens? And so I think in, in, in our work, we have to think of plan A, plan B, and C, and maybe even D. Um, and so like, how are you adjusting with the changes and, and not letting that um, overtake you and keep you from being productive in that work? Sure, I can imagine with that event space, the need for that being super high. And especially just thinking about how COVID then would have, you know, um, affected a lot of that, that type of, of work specifically. Giselle or Gerald, anything else that you would add? Yeah, just to echo what Tanisha said, um, being adaptable, absolutely, especially with, when working with students. Um, it's kind of a weird analogy, but I wrote it down. I wanted to share it. So I've likened being an academic advise, advisor to being a bridge, um, which is a little weird um, at face value, but um, so it pretty much means the student has an idea where they wanna go. And my job is to help them get there, hence the bridge part. And we'll assist them, do whatever I can to help them get there. But at the same time, plans always change. When I was in my undergrad, I changed my major three times, so I understand. So whenever the plan changes, that's okay. And my job is to just adjust every time with them. Um, if they need to adjust their goal and move the bridge per se, um, we absolutely can. And I think another important thing for um, academic advising for sure um, is something I said a little earlier is when trying to understand what someone is really trying to say to you. So I've had a lot of students will come in, let's say they did poorly on a midterm. And, you know, we kind of talk about and they say, I'm so tired. Um, and I could easily take that as face value, like, okay, maybe you should sleep more. Um, but instead, you know, if you're trying to understand what they're trying to say to you, um, there are you know, a variety of factors that can play into I'm tired. And together, you know, when you work with them on that, you can find different ways to help manage the stress, so manage the workload, or try to find healthy ways of coping 
instead of you know whatever they're doing in that in that moment to make them not be as successful as I know they can. Be. So I think for skills for academic advising, I think those are the definitely the top two. Yeah, um, I agree definitely with, you know, the adaptability component. And I think I really like your bridge analogy. Um, I think it speaks to, I think it's really important in higher ed regardless, but specifically, like, I think all of our roles are very kind of people facing as well. Just having a general like compassion for others is very important, um, especially like with admission counseling, like I get a lot of I mean, it's unfortunate, but, you know, you do get the occasional, you know, rough parent or if people are very stressed out, there's a lot of, you know, financial things going into this. Those are serious decisions being made. So I think being able to, like, listen despite not necessarily being in a comfortable position um, to, like, further, like, get to bridge that gap and better understand where they're coming from makes the job a lot easier. And nine times out of ten, just people just want somebody to listen to them. Um, so if you are willing to be like compassionate enough to just lend the ear, most times they talk themselves down from wherever they were and end up feeling very assisted and helped by that situation. So I would say compassion for sure. And then also just a general kind of like public speaking thing. I've definitely garnered more public speaking skills in this position, but not being afraid to like understanding that everybody's people and we're all just trying to find answers and help each other out. So um, just being comfortable, like knowing that everyone is okay and we can all comfortably speak to each other. So, yeah. That's a great point. What are some ways that students can begin to build related experience when you each think about kind of the, the type of role you're in now? So if someone was, you know, really interested in being an academic advisor or student involvement or admissions. I think about, um, you know, I, I go back to like my journey and even though like when I set out undergrad, it was not um, on my mind that I would be in higher ed student affairs. Um, but I think like the things that I did were ways that I built um, experience without even knowing that I was doing that. And so it started with like um, my student leader uh, in my involvement journey um, in undergrad and how I was um, identifying um, opportunities that I wanted to be a part of um, and be involved with um, to, you know, not only build community, but also make connections with people and really kind of see how that takes me. And so um, that came with joining some student organizations um, that came with, um, you know, student employment through being a tour guide and an orientation guide. Um, I think once I got into my master's program, um, I had an assistantship. And so that was other ways I was able to get practical um, experience. Um, internships was also something that I was able to do. And so I think that um, when students have students who are interested in being a student involvement or, you know, campus activities offices, um, kind of thinking about, yeah, what does your involvement journey look like right now? Also, if there's opportunities to um, attend workshops and seminars, there's various different opportunities that are out there. Um, definitely take advantage of it. Um, also, if there's ever an opportunity to attend a national conference um, that is, um, you know, focused with uh, campus activities because they exist, because um, we're involved in them, um, take, that, take that opportunity because that's where a lot of that learning takes place. And also like, um, connect with professional staff members. People are always excited to, at least I am, when people reach out to me and want to talk about my journey. I'm happy um, to have those conversations with people and, and try to create opportunities um, for students to be more involved or just to shadow and, and kind of just learn and, and be able to ask questions um, in effort to get the information and resources that they need to set them up for success to go on this journey really good piece of pieces of advice there. Anything to add, Giselle or Joe? Um, I would just kind of echo what Tanisha said, like, truthfully, like, even getting into this role, I felt comfortable doing it because I had experience as a tour guide, as a student employee. So definitely just like, Student employment is a really good way to do that specifically with all positions in higher ed, I think. Um, you just kind of get 
a little bit of a ground floor basic understanding of how things kind of run on like the institutional level. Um, and then, yeah, also just like getting involved, just finding out like interests that you like and then you find and build community and network that way. So, yeah. Yeah, I think just I to echo what both of them said, um, even just speaking with whatever role you think you want to do. I remember when I was in college, um, I, can, I considered academic advising and I, I set up a meeting with my academic advisor. I was like, how did you get to where you are? Like, I think this job looks fun. And just picking the brain um, about, you know, interviewing with someone in, that's in a role that you think you'd want to pursue in the future, seeing, you know, seeing their career path and how they got to their point. Um, it's funny because I've spoken with a lot of academic advisors. We all have different majors. We all had different backgrounds that led us to academic advising. I came from teaching. All my coworker came from admissions. Very, very different. And we're both here now. So um, a lot of academic advisors, we have very diverse um, backgrounds coming into this role, which I think is a really good thing because having a diverse background, it allows us the opportunity to understand multiple different avenues. And if I don't understand something, I can absolutely ask my colleague okay, what did you do in this situation? Their, you know, their background was maybe a little similar to yours. Um, at the same time, too, if you know you want to work in higher ed, I think having experience working and helping uh, people regardless of age um, is, is a good thing, too. Um, when I was in college, I volunteered a lot of time working with At Promise Youth, um, our homeless population in Chicago. I also coach football and high school sports. So the more experience you have and in roles where you um, help people get where they want to go, I think the better. So if you have the time to do that, absolutely. Can you share maybe one thing that feels like kind of the reward part of your role and then one thing that maybe feels a little bit more challenging in your role? Um, I can start. Um, for me, I would say the most rewarding is, I mean, it's been difficult with COVID, but specifically I will, there are certain students where they just have a, a million questions. So we've been in contact for weeks going back and forth with different things. Um, so finally getting to like meet them or see that they've like really adjusted to their time at DePaul and they're having a great time is amazing. Like I, we had a um, college of education event and one of my students who I had been messaging for literally since I started this job, like my first ever student, um, he was there and he like gave me a hug and I got to talk to him and his mom, which was awesome. So like, that's definitely like the, the bright side of my position. And then kind of similar, but opposite to that, I would say the downfall is when um, you can just tell that specifically like families or students are kind of just going through it and despite like my best efforts nothing is really coming together for them um, whether it be like either usually um either not on DePaul's end or just like on their end like I read also a lot of very sad college essays um, so reading those back to back can be very very hard um knowing because students are very honest in these essays as well um so yeah, that's probably the downsides to that. Um, I would say like, um, I'll start with the rewarding um, one. I think when there, when there's instances where, um, you know, connecting with students and, um, you know, they're confiding in me and telling me like, oh, like, I want to get involved, but I don't know where to start at, or um, I feel lonely <laughs> on campus. Like, how do I make friends? How do I find community? And like, after you have conversations with those students and, you know, give them some different avenues of how to, um, you know, make progress and resolve uh, some of those things that they're battling with. And then you actually see them making friends and attending events and, and finding ways to get involved. Like, um, those are very rewarding um, times for me. I think also like, um, you know, when you're planning campus events and you're working with those students um, and they are giving their all um, to make sure that they are getting this right. Um, and then you end up having a very successful event and like seeing the smile on their face at the end of the night after they've done something very great. Um, that's also, I think, rewarding. And I think another part is like, when they make it to commencement 
and um, and they're reflecting on their time here at the institution and they say like, thank you for all that you did. And, and thank you for helping me with this or helping me do this and, and seeing potential um, in them. Um, and knowing that like, yes, this is rewarding work that we're doing. Um, you know, our office is really contributing to the co-curricular experience here at DePaul. And so I, I think that's the rewarding side. Um, I think what the challenging part is that like, um, you know, oftentimes you're working with people and again, you see their potential and you know that they um, can, can really make a lot of positive impact. Um, but like when you hear their stories of like, oh, well, I applied for this opportunity and I didn't get it. Um, and when you know there's nothing that you can do to change the outcome, um, those, are, those are challenging times. Um, or when you have students who have um, done amazing work, um, you know, in organizations and they say, well, I can't do this anymore because, um, you know, I may have a conflicting um, commitment or obligation that I just don't have time or maybe um, things in the classroom are, um, you know, maybe stressing them out or whatever the circumstance is and they have to step away from their involvement. Those are challenging times because it's, of course, you know, that degree is important. That's why they're here um, to get that degree and graduate. Um, but it's also kind of sad for us where it's like, oh, we had a really great student um, and, and they've got to step away. Yeah, so I think the most rewarding aspect of my role would be um, definitely when students complete their degree. Um, you know, I meet them when they first come in um, as incoming freshmen or incoming grad students. And when they finish um, and in between that, I. You know, we have a lot of advising appointments. We spend a lot of time talking. So you really get to know the student really, really well. So when they finish and you have that last advising appointment, it is, it's really, really fun because um, you can see that they're pretty much just waiting for their grades to be posted. And they're talking about what they're gonna be doing after completing the program. And you, know, you can see how much they've really grown in the two, three, four years, however long they were here. And when they're finally done, it's, it is a lot of fun. And those are really, really fun and exciting conversations. They can say, you know, um, I applied for this job, I'm interviewing here, I'm interviewing here, and it's it's really, really cool to hear. And I really enjoy writing reference letters. I think they're really fun. I like to personalize them. Um, and I, I think it's a nice way to cap off our journey together, you know, through their academic career um, by handing them that and sending them on their way. And then I usually get an email a few months later saying, hey, thanks for everything, I got this job. And it's really, really great. So um, at the same time, some of the most challenging things are when you when you do meet some students who have so much so much promise, but they're you know the outside life and you know your life outside of school, outside of work, and everything. It starts getting to you, and it starts really affecting um, your schoolwork and your goals. And sometimes students have to put their school on pause, or sometimes um, sometimes they entirely drop the program altogether. And those are those are tough because there's not really anything I can do um, for a lot of situations, and it's hard because you have those conversations, I want to be a teacher because of this, I want to do this because of this. And then if they have to leave, you know, it does, it does tug on the heartstrings a little bit. Um, but, you know, for it, 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 it's just a great opportunity um, just to meet with these students and get to know them for, you know, their college careers. It's, it's great. So there's a definite theme just in terms of kind of like, being able to see students through that journey of their time at DePaul, which is neat. Um, can you discuss a little bit how networking has played a role in your professional journey? Yeah, I'll, I'll start this one. Um, so I tell this story um, a lot when it when it comes up in conversations, um, like the question of like, how did you get to DePaul? Um, what attracted you here? Um, and I always share the story of how um, being involved in um, the professional organization, um, National Association for Campus Activities, um, that's how I met my current supervisor, um, Courtney, um, is through our involvement um, in that organization. And like we were on um, the same planning committee um, and uh, we were just having some conversations and she was just, um, you know, kind of asking me some different questions, you know, about like what I saw, you know, my career tra tra trajectory, sorry, um, looking like. And so um, like, that's how I learned about the job here at DePaul. And so um, like, I wouldn't be here at DePaul um, if it wasn't for um, like the networking that 
what's happening um, at that um, national conference and, and being able to sit down and talk with her and, and really um, you know, see what this opportunity was going to be about. So um, it has made all the difference, um, especially with me being here at DePaul, but I think also like just in general, I think the connections that you're able to make um, when you are network networking with others um, can set you up for some great opportunities. Like um, you never know when you may have to reach back to your network um, and, and see like, oh, how can you make a connection for me for this job over here that I'm interested in or, or how they can introduce you to a, a community of people um, that could help to pour into you to um, help you get to the next level. So it's it's definitely made all the difference for me. That's a neat story. Yes, so networking for me has been a tremendous help. So I mentioned a little earlier that when I was in my undergrad, I asked my academic advisor to tell me about the role. And for me, that actually worked out because when she was leaving this role, she actually reached out to me and said, I thought you'd, I think you'd be a really good fit. So um, by having that conversation, um, it really helped me land this role that I'm in now and in interviewing for this role too um, at DePaul, I actually reached out and had a sit down with a few academic advisors across the college. And what they did was they helped me prep for the interview. They gave me a pretty in-depth look on what academic advising is. Um, and something I've also done too is, um, you know, I've always stayed in contact with a lot of my supervisors. Even when I worked in Chicago Public Schools, I still have relationships with the staff there, with the department heads, um, sometimes with the administration and it's helped a lot of our students now, um, when if I know they need a teacher, it's a very easy way for me to connect them. So networking not only helps you, it can help you know your students in the future as well. And um, something my sister told me, um, and she loves the network. She said, you know, you never turn down a cup of coffee. So if someone asks you to have a cup of coffee just to chat and talk, um, you never know what you can learn and what, what roles you can't, um, what roles you can't do. Um, I think too, um, the big a big thing that I've done and made sure I've done is I've made sure to thank people along the way. You know, my previous advisor, my previous supervisors, a lot of them have gone out of their way to, tr to train me in things maybe that I didn't need to learn, but I would eventually need. And luckily for me, um, you know, I've, I've had that opportunity to have some great supervisors and I've always thanked them. And whenever possible, if the students reach out to me or anyone reaches out to me, I'll, you know, there's nothing wrong with a 30 minute sit down telling them what I know and hopefully they can pass on that information as well. So networking is huge. I always recommend, you know, asking for a cup of coffee because you never know where it can lead you. Um, yeah, I would say networking was also kind of crucial to me getting this position. Mostly like my connections that I had made um, as a student employee at DePaul definitely um, assisted me because like my boss from when I was a student employee is my boss right now. So I ended up being really helpful and amazing. Um, but I think, because for me, I remember like the concept of networking sounded so daunting and kind of really important. And I had no idea what that really entailed. Um, but I pretty much understand now it's just being like open to talking to people. Like Gerald said, like, don't decline the cup of coffee. Like if you see someone even in passing, just being like, oh, I, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, my cat's freaking out. Um, just being like, oh, I really like your shoes today. Or this is nice weather. Like the small talk really can lead to just bigger things and just being open to seeing like where a conversation with somebody could go, um, I think is kind of what is the, the backbone of networking in my opinion. Um, so kind of like taking it off of this pedestal of like, this is really crucial and I won't do anything without talking to people, but it's a lot easier than I think it seems going into it. Um, I definitely think it's important and it's just really helpful. Um, it's also like fun connecting with people, um, kind of get like different perspectives and maybe even answers that you didn't know that you needed. Like you talk to somebody in a position and you're like, wait, I actually don't know if I want to do that. So just talking and hearing perspectives and being open um, is really important. But yeah. Yeah, and I appreciate you saying that, Giselle, because I think a lot of students feel intimidated by networking and um you know, just are a little bit unsure of what that looks like. So definitely come meet with me or Ellie, um, just in terms of strategies for networking or how to kind of reframe and think about it 
in a way that maybe feels a little bit more authentic or genuine because I think that's what I hear from a lot of students it feels like they're not being themselves and so there's definitely strategies to make that feel a little bit more comfortable um, so to speak. I think we are going to end with one last question and then we'll open it up to the audience um, and so any just one piece of advice or resource or anything you would recommend for somebody who is interested in higher education? I can go first. Um, I would say my last piece of advice would be um, to ask questions and to be authentic. When you're authentically yourself in higher education, um, it's really easy um, for the students to um, sort of relate to you um, and I think that's really, really helpful. And um, you don't feel like you have to put on a face and you can truly be you. And um, and yeah, I think that's super helpful. And ask questions, always ask a bunch of questions. I ask my boss questions all the time um, or else I wouldn't know, so. Yeah, I'd say the same thing, like questions. I, like no question is like stupid. Um, like, how will you learn the information that you need to know if you're not asking people? And nine times out of 10, like most people are really enthusiastic to like give you that knowledge and pass on that knowledge. Um, I would also say um, in terms of like getting into higher ed, I would say a really good resource is the Career Center. That helped me get to here. So can't plug it enough. Um, just really, really great. I also loved Handshake when I was actively participating in that as well. So. Um, yeah, and then also just like, I think I didn't realize this for a long time, but if you know of certain like organizations or like things you're trying to get interested in, a lot of them have staff directory pages. You can just reach out to people directly through that. Um, and most people are very enthusiastic about responding to that. So a staff directory <laughs> is, my, is my resource. Um, I think the one piece of advice I would of is um, just to encourage um, students uh, to take advantage of opportunities um, that are available um, at the institution um, to attend a variety of um, whether it's a campus event or a program or um, a particular whatever the particular offering that different departments and offices are providing um, that way that you can kind of get a sense of like what are the different components that make up higher education? Um, so like, yes, there are um, a few different areas represented here today. However, there is so much more um, to higher education. And so, um, you know, oftentimes what you see right in front of you, um, you may like, oh my gosh, this, this is what I want to do. So let me just like, you know, do tunnel vision straight towards this. Um, however, I would say like, there is so much that DePaul has to offer in, in, in a variety of departments and offices. Um, so yeah, when there's opportunities to make connections with them and, and attend their programs and events, um, definitely take advantage of that. All really, really good pieces of advice there. And obviously, um, please feel free to meet with myself or Ellie just in terms of you know, how do you explore within higher education, some of those different networking strategies um, and things like that. I am going to open it up for questions from the audience. And I know I did miss a question earlier from Isabella. Um, and thank you for joining us from public trans transportation. I appreciate that. Um, and so her question, I think, might be specific to Gerald. And the question was, um, do you need a minor or major in teaching education to teach? And I'm assuming that Isabella is meaning teaching in K-12, but feel free to throw in the chat if that is not accurate. College level teaching. So, Gerald, do you want to answer this? Would you like me to answer it? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead, yeah. Sure. So college level teaching actually looks a little bit different, Isabella, and obviously feel free to get on mine or Ellie's calendar to talk about this a little bit more in depth, um, but there's faculty positions and faculty positions um, do require a PhD. However, in, in faculty, I would kind of describe it very briefly as like full-time. So you're teaching full-time at a university, you you know receive benefits and, and that sort of thing as a, a full-time role. There's also something called adjunct teaching or being an adjunct instructor. Um, and so 
being an adjunct instructor means that you aren't working full time for that university, um, but you're maybe teaching a class here or there. So right now I'm actually teaching on Wednesday nights a class for um, the counseling department in the College of Education. So I work full time as a staff member, as an advisor for DePaul University, but then I'm teaching a class on the side. So um, I would say that adjunct teaching, it's very difficult to try to adjunct teach without that PhD full time. Um, and so we can definitely answer some like nitty gritty questions about this, just in terms of logistics and what this looks like um, and recommend some people for you to discuss further with. But if you're wanting to be like a full-time faculty, usually it's that, that PhD that you'll need. Um, and then there are some roles that I would say are almost kind of in between where you're maybe working as a staff and you maybe don't have that PhD, but you're um, teaching some classes. Um, sometimes those might require a master's and a specific license, um, depending on what you're teaching or having an ed D. So again, we can definitely talk more further in depth if you have additional questions about that, feel free to get on our calendar, but really good question because I do think that's particularly confusing. Um, and Ellie just threw in the link how to make an appointment with us. So thank you, Ellie, because that's super helpful. Um, if you do have additional questions. Other questions from the audience, really good question, Isabella. Other questions from the audience though, before we let our wonderful panelists go to hopefully enjoy a few minutes outside before their next commitment of the day. And so Ellie is gonna actually send out a quick poll here while we just see if anyone else has more questions for our students or alum that are attending. If you don't mind filling that out, I think it's maybe three questions, so super short. Um, and then, like I said, if you are RSVP'd on Handshake, you'll also get the recording to this event. If there are no more questions, I just want to, you know, thank Tanisha and Gerald and Giselle so much for joining us today. I know um, working in higher ed myself that we are all very, very busy. So for you guys to give up your, um, probably what you did not even a lot for a lunch break, we really appreciate it. Um, and being able to, to share this great information with students. So thank you all for joining us, students and alum as well. And please feel free to make an appointment with us in the Career Center to talk more about working in higher ed. I hope everyone has a wonderful day.